sat me down and basically said, since the incidents happened, he's gone and reached out to every rape crisis center in Chicago and met with the people who run it and sat down and talked to them. Uh, he's donated money to all the rape crisis centers. He has uh, uh, been taking rape sensitivity classes, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things about me is uh, we all make mistakes. I've made mistakes and I'm going to make more, believe me. And talking to Miguel today, I was in the same position he was in a couple years ago. And it's not, and, 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 and it's not about the mistake that you make, it's how you handle yourself after you make that mistake. And there's some guys in this sport who deny, lie, say they didn't do this, they didn't do that, there, there, there's a conspiracy going on. He didn't do any of that. He went and handled himself like a man, and I respect that. So, uh, we got together today, he talked to me, and, and uh, he's back in the UFC. So, and here's the thing too, now, I was criticized for cutting him, now I'll be criticized for bringing him back. The bottom line is I don't give a shit what anybody thinks, or what anybody says. I don't give a fuck what your opinion is, I'm going to do this the way that I, I do it. You don't go on Twitter, and you don't make rape jokes. I don't give a fuck if they're... Uh, if they're from a TV show, if some comedian told it and you think it's the funniest joke in the world, you just don't do it. And out of the blue and out of nowhere. It just, it makes no sense. And uh, that's why this thing went down. I explained to you why he's back now. He, he's handled his business like a man. And, and, and what, I th what he did, I think, is honorable. He wasn't told to do it. He wasn't told, if you do this, we'll think about bringing you back. If you do this, you'll come back. He wasn't told anything because we never talked. So, I'll let you take it from there. Um, I want to first uh, thank my family, my friends, uh, my manager, Glenn Robinson, for supporting me and, uh, and being with me and helping me make the right decisions and doing the right thing. Um, you know, I never knew I had so many supporters until this happened, and I'm very appreciative for all my fans. Uh, all I wanted for Christmas was to be back in the UFC. I've dedicated my whole life, since I was 13 years old, since I watched the first UFCs, to be a UFC fighter and be a UFC champion. And uh, I've dedicated my whole life and my whole essence to this sport. And uh, when I got cut, it showed me that, you know, what I say on Twitter, what I say on social media is very powerful. And uh, I took a lot of heat for what I said. You know, I manned up, I took it on the chin. And I realized my words are very powerful. And, uh, and I'm very sorry for that. You know, I know what I say can hurt people. Um, Dana White, Lance Petita, they, they took me back in. And I'm very appreciative and I thank them very much for that. Thank, thank you. you, bro. You're a man. Thank you did the right thing. Here's what it is. Hey. Miguel, how, how long has this three weeks been for you not knowing exactly what was going to happen, whether you'd be back, how soon you might be able to come back, and, and what was your backup plan if you weren't able to come back? I didn't have a backup plan, you know, I mean, I know I always have a career doing something. Um, I made, you know, I, I pretty much made my way up here fighting one fight at a time, and, uh, you know, I had no other choices. For me, the only, the end game is the UFC. So if I can't find the UFC, then I'm going to train fighters, run my gym, and, you know, and, and continue with my life. Um, no. I had no, I had no... Backup plans. I know I made a mistake. I, I could have reacted a lot of different ways, and I didn't. You know, I I grew up where if you get slapped, you slap back, and I, I, I felt you know I, I wanted to lash out. I, I stayed quiet so I could think about what I said. What I said was very wrong, and you know I had to I had to learn from my mistake. I had to become a better person, and that's why I took this, I took this opportunity to grow, not to not to to hurt. Two wrongs don't make a right, and. People can say whatever they want, other people can say whatever they want. What I said was wrong, what I said hurt somebody. It hurt a lot of people, and I had to man up for that. Now, um, it's kind of charitable in, in Northwest Indiana. Can you talk a little bit about some of the places that you donated money to? Um, if you give me your email, I will give you a full list of, of different uh, different organizations that donated money to. And then what was the support like? You know, back home in the community where you've always been. Uh, it was actually it was it was really hard. It was really hard. I, I maintained my silence and I made a statement. You know, an apology to my fans and, and, and my friends and my family. And uh, I wanted that to be the only thing on my on my Facebook account and my Twitter account. Mm -hmm. Every, any fan that I have, anyone that goes to my account, sees that that's that's my stance and what I'm doing. And I wanted to be I wanted to be educated on the subject more. I wanted to see how it affected people. I wanted to see what I could do to change things, what I could do to become a better person before I talked to anybody. And thankfully Dana White met with me today. None of this was planned. I had no... I, yesterday I got my flight to come here to talk to him. You know, I, I thank God that he took the time to, t you know, to give me the time to talk to me and listen to my flight. And uh, I'm very appreciative for that.
Dana, now that this chapter is kind of closed, I mean, you've talked about it a little bit, but is there need for formal outlines, formal policy well, of what these guys should or shouldn't sense. say? It's common sense. And listen, sometimes we got to go through stuff like this to realize. Same thing that happened to me a couple of years ago. You say something, you know, he didn't say anything. He's not joking about whatever. He, you know, when you're with your small group of guys and you're making jokes and, and you know, you're doing your thing, but when you get out on these Twitter or whatever it might be, you walk this fine line, man. And, 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 and a lot of it, some of it's bullshit. Some of the stuff that comes back is bullshit. You got people that are trying to mess with you. But some of it is real, and some of it, you know, uh, for instance, I mean, my my my, my infamous uh, video blog. You know how many groups called me up and wanted apologies from that one from that one video blog? I gave an apology to one group. You know. Why because, did you apologize to all of them? Because I felt that I should have to that group. The rest of them were all full of shit. You know what I mean? Because believe me, you want to talk about you know when they talk about. First of all, you know that when people come out on my Twitter and say dumb shit to me, I say dumb shit back to you, okay? You give it to me, I'm gonna give it right back to you. Now we had some group saying that I'm bullying people on, on shut up. If you opt in to follow me and you come and talk shit to me, get ready, it's coming back. And I'm better at it than you are. <laughs> Dana, I see exactly what you're saying about common sense, but some people will say that common sense is, is, is If I need is to write guidelines, thing. Well, well, what about what about just like like a guy writing Tebow like where was God with the four interceptions? I mean that right there could offend some people, but some people don't don't care yeah. at all. So I mean, yeah. what do you do? That one doesn't bother me. <laughs> See, it doesn't bother yeah. me either, but it bothers a yeah, ton of other people. I guess so. we're on my scale then. <laughs> okay, we'll go by my scale because a lot of lot of stuff out there is bullshit. And believe me, I've dealt with more of these groups than you guys could ever imagine. And what they try to do is a lot of these groups. You want to talk about bullying? You want to talk about bullying? A lot of these groups out there, if you even have an ounce of fame and you say something that they deem, you know, they come after you, man. And they come after you to tear you down and rip you apart. You know, they're not just looking for an apology. They're looking to make an example out of you, you know? And, and, and I, I have this job where we walk this fine line. Social media is real, man. It's not going anywhere. It's the future. It's going to be the biggest thing the world has ever seen. It's only getting bigger and everybody's getting into it. And you're, you know, there's always going to be somebody who's offended or has an agenda and is going to say something. But I think we do a pretty good job of, of siphoning out the bullshit and what's real. Why not formally articulate your skill? Because I don't want to. I'll go on a, I'll go on a, I, 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 I'm dealing with smart guys. We have intelligent guys here, and, and like he said, when, when we sat down this morning and he talked to me, what he told me today was awesome. And I was more than impressed, and I, and I respect him very much. So he went out and, and, and took it like a man and, and did what he had to do, wasn't told to do anything, wasn't promised anything if he did this, wasn't even said, maybe we'll do this. I didn't talk to him at all. I didn't talk to him, Lorenzo didn't talk to him, nobody from the UFC talked to this, to this man. He fucking went and did it by himself, and I respect that. That's hey, it. I didn't hear what you, you said. I, I, you know, I didn't hear what you said because I was way in the back there, but I was just wondering, did you have any personal interaction with somebody who explained to you why what you said hurt yeah, them or bothered them? I met, I met five different rape crisis centers in the Chicago Island area. And, uh, yeah. Um, I met with I went with five different uh, rape organizations, rape counseling centers in the Chicagoland area, and uh, basically what I did was I sat down and I met. I was basically you know told what what I said, why it hurt people, um, how powerful my words really were, and why it wasn't funny. And uh, it was one of those things where you know I was walking, I didn't know what to expect. I thought I was going to go and apologize, and I I was there for about an hour, hour and a half in each center, getting a full rundown of. Rape victims are not just, you know, was, I got I got educated basically. I got put to school. And what did they uh, why it wasn't funny? What was the Because it because it, it hurts people. It words are hurtful. And there are victims out there who have been through that and it's not funny. And you mentioned all the criticism you got when this decision was made. A lot of people came out against you. Was there any point before today that you kinda of wavered and thought, maybe I didn't make the right call in that situation? Nobody nobody buries me in Twitter, nobody writes stories, nobody does anything to make. When I make a decision, I make a decision because I, I, that, that's what I think is the right thing to do. 
and nobody's gonna make me second guess myself. Nobody. I know what I did was the right thing, and I know what I'm doing now is the right thing. And I'm gonna get criticized either way. I could give a shit. You know, this is my company, and I'll run it the way that I want to. Do you remember the? Uh, I didn't answer my phone for three weeks. I'm sure all you guys tried calling me because my phone was going crazy when all this happened, and I spoke to no one. I turned my phone off. I didn't speak to anybody. I have an assistant. She took my phone calls and called back whoever was business that I can pertain to. But other than that, medium-wise, I spoke to no one. My manager, Glenn Robinson, he handled all this business for me on the side. So if offers are made, they are made to him. But I spoke to no one about anything. My my future and my life is is here in the UFC. I made I made a mistake and. I want to be back, and I'm back now. And, and, and it's hard to explain what you go through when something like this happens, you know? I, I've been there and done it. And then you get labeled. I'm labeled as a homophobe, you know? They still come after me for that, you know? And uh, it's the furthest thing from the truth. And if I was, I'd tell you. Trust me. I'd have a reason, and I'd explain it to you on why I was. I'm not. I'm the furthest thing from it. But once that happens to you, and they come after you, that's what you're labeled as. You know, and he, he said the same thing. Uh, the first thing he said to me is in Chicago, they think he's a rapist. Chinese telephone is not a funny thing. I'm hanging out with some buddies of mine at a, at a restaurant, and they're playing some Spike TV UFC fights, and uh, I hear some of the guys talking about why Miguel Torres got fired. And they didn't know why. They didn't know the reason why. They only knew a little bit of the story. So they labeled me right away. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a heavy thing to carry. You know, I can't go to the grocery store. I can't, you know, front page of the paper I gave, no one knew my side of the story, why I said what I said, what was going on. I stayed quiet just so I can know the first move I make had to be the right one. And people took it however they, they had a little word or a little reason and they ran with it. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. How much does hearing that kind of uh, characterization bother you? It bothers me very much. I'm, I'm a grown man. I'm very responsible. You know, I do a lot of charitable things. In my gym, I train kids for free. I have my The reason I have my gym where I have it now, I can live anywhere I want in the world. I live, I choose to live where I live on purpose to get back to my community. There's so much talent in the ghettos that gets wasted on gangs and drugs and violence and single parent homes and all these different things. And I stay there for a reason. And there's a ton of things that I do on the side that no one knows about. I'm just a crazy dude with a messed up haircut that fights for a living. No one knows what I do on the side except people who I affect their everyday lives. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's hard to be labeled or to have that word associated with you. It's very hard. But that was my mistake, and I'm only up for that. What did your wife say to you, and how did she react to the whole controversy? Actually, before I wrote that, I asked her if she, if she thought that was too much. She goes, you write a lot of crazy things on Twitter. Wow. Okay. So. Does it change, you know, I know a lot of people are criticizing you for, the, you know, just your general Twitter approach. This, has this experience changed how you will approach what you do on Twitter now? Oh, 100% I'm going to be very cautious about what I write. You know, I'm not going to write anything offensive to anyone. I'm still going to have, I have, I have my style, my, my kind of humor, but more more uh, aware of, of who I'm speaking to. I, I know how my words affect and impact people. They're very powerful. Dana, at the Fighters Summit, when you guys told these guys to tweet more, did you kind of give them any kind of education about this kind of thing, like how it could have negative effects? No, I mean, I, I didn't see this coming, but you, you know, the, it's a no-brainer. When you let guys run wild and they're on Twitter tweeting, this stuff's going to happen. This isn't the last time. This will happen again. Now hopefully, you know, th this situation, the guys will look at this thing and go, you know. And everybody's sense of humor is different. Some things you guys think funny, I probably don't, and vice versa. But the, the bottom line is, the, the hard part about Twitter is it's not like you can go out and make a joke. And then everybody's like, Miguel Torres, what are you doing? Well, let me explain myself. Yeah. You only have so many characters to, you know. And then every time a new tweet comes in, I'm like, I can't fucking wait to hear this one. And I'm waiting for when I call to get the explanation from the guys. It's just, you know, and, and it's got to make sense to me. Dana, does, do you have, though, now now that, you know, you had the situation with Rashad, with Forrest, with Miguel, going forward, like, do you now have less of a tolerance for, to you know, jokes on that particular topic or any... Any obviously offensive topic like that, where the next person yeah. to do it, you know, makes that comment, do you give them the same opportunity that you gave Miguel to come back? We're dealing, we're dealing with guys. There's one thing that you guys have to understand, and most of you never will, what it's like to deal with fighters and what it's like to be a fighter and to live in this world that they live in. And there's going to be times when heated stuff happens. I'm not happy that Nate slapped Cerrone's hat off today. You know what I mean? I don't like the guys touching each other, 
at the that's why I'm standing there. I'm not there to fucking mug up into the camera. I'm there to make sure that shit doesn't happen. I didn't do my job today apparently, but things are going to happen and things are going to be said in the heat of the moment. It's going to happen. It's it, they're fighters and that's the way it is. They've been they've been away from their families, training hard, you know, going through miserable shit to fight this other guy that they don't like because this person is torturing them in, in right. a sense. But when you're sitting home on your couch, right. eating fucking Fritos and fucking around on Twitter, I want you to really think. Think about what you're going to say and what you're going to tweet. Oh, let's even talk about that. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> well, I'd have said that and then I'd have been, uh, you know, <laughs> true, true. He said he ate tacos because he's Mexican. Hey, can I ask you a question about UFC in Vegas? Imagine a day where there'll be maybe a few, fewer cards, but bigger cards. Like the fewer cards, but bigger cards. What does that mean? Like with with going worldwide, cards everywhere. You know, and, and a lot. I know you guys are based here, but what do you see for the future? Kind of, do you, do you see it staying the same, or do you see maybe like the headliners really, you know, being here in Vegas, like a, like a New Year's Eve card with less people? Yeah. Yeah, they are now. I mean, the, the, the cards that we do here in Vegas, the cards that we do everywhere are big cards. I mean, there's different levels of fights. If you have the pay-per-views, you have the fight nights, um, you know, there's obviously different levels. But all the pay-per-views are, yeah, big fights and, and, and all the headliners. So you don't see any change, like, going forward? I mean, you always want to be in Vegas with a bunch of big cards every year. Yeah, I want to be in every major city for, on pay-per-view with big cards. Vegas included. Hey, David, you're widely praised for being you know, so open and honest with us, but in Toronto, you're in kind of an awkward position in that everybody kept asking you over and over. We keep hearing Alistair may be out, he may be out, he may be out. Obviously, we, we thought it was an injury. We weren't saying licensing, but can you talk about being in a position where maybe you can't always share everything? Yeah, no, I, I, heard, I heard something like that. Like somebody said, oh, he lied when he said that. In a million years, I didn't see that coming. I didn't think Al that that shit was going to go down with Alistar. Had no idea. So no idea that that was going to happen. So you were on the podium in Toronto. You were yeah, I was at the podium in Toronto, and it was actually Kevin had tweeted that he heard Alistar was out. I'm like, no, he's not out. In a million years, I didn't know that was coming. Nobody he, did. He heard about it basically the same time. It happened, yeah, Alistair. exactly. All that shit went down after that. Yeah, there's going to be times when I have to lie to you. I'm honest when I have to lie to you. Like, don't ask me about the ultimate fighter. Don't ask me about this. I can't tell you. And yes, I will lie to you. But I, I, I no, no way, shape, or form did I see that coming. You know? I didn't. Season 15, the greatest I, season ever? I would have had, I think so. It was a great season. <laughs> it was a great season. I would have, uh, and, and believe me, we would. If, if I knew that at that press conference, we'd have already been working on a backup plan. Which there was no backup plan. There was nothing. I, I had no idea. That there was discussions coming. that Frank Mir was to talk to you. That's not true then? He was. No, he was after that went down. Okay. He absolutely was talked to. Yeah. Then obviously, you, you sent a message with Miguel Torres to a lot of fighters and obviously you can't write guidelines to what they can discuss on Twitter. If there were five subjects, if you were as a fighter, on short, you should be talking, not talking about it. What are those topics? Well, I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't making an example out of him. You sent a message. It, it went the way that it went. He could still be out of the UFC right now if he didn't handle it the way that he did. I mean, this guy handled it like a man and, and did what he was supposed to do without being told. So I, I respect that. I mean, five things that you shouldn't say on Twitter. I mean, you should be talking about fights. You should be talking about fights. You should be talking to fans. You should be talking about your friends, your family, whatever you're doing. You know, you might want to stay away from uh, rape, race, uh, and probably a lot of other things. You know, I, I deal with smart guys. Not like I got I got 375 morons under contract. You know, I got I got smart guys. Common sense. Let common sense prevail. There's a couple of shows like a big thing for me after I fight. Like he was telling you guys earlier, when I train for a fight, I leave for two months. I don't see my family, my friends. My, I'm away from my business. I, my, my life basically ends at home, and I leave to Montreal, to Florida, wherever I'm training for my fight. I go to TriStar for two months. I'm in Canada, and basically what I have on the phone or on email is how I communicate with my family and my friends. So when I come home, I don't, I don't follow MMA websites. I don't 
no knock to you guys. Like, my mind has been so entrenched. I live this stuff. When I come home, I don't want to go on, on Twitter and see what this guy's saying. Or what that guy. I don't want to know what they said about me. I did that in the beginning of my career when I was in WC. And I had WC champ. And there was a million keyboard warriors giving me their opinion on what they think about me and what I should do to get better. And what I could, you know, like, I don't want to hear that. I know what I do. I know what I got to do. I have a great coaching staff. I have a great management team. You know, I have a great boss. You know, I... I know what I gotta do. When I come home, I want to see my daughter. I want to spend time with my family. I want to. I want to be in my gym. I want to. I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to watch news. News is depressing to me. Every time I watch the news, it's bad stuff is happening. So I stay away from that. I watch TV shows that I find funny. Always sunny Philadelphia, workaholics, Family Guy, and they all touch on different subjects that they shouldn't. That that, that are funny. They're jokes, and I laugh at them. I'm. I don't endorse it. I'm, I'm not trying to. You know. There was a show that I watched called Workaholics, and they were making a comment about that. I made a general comment about it. You know, the other but it's that true. I, That's why Twitter is the wrong forum to do it. You right. put out a joke, and you can't explain yourself. Right. You just, you know, why did you put this out? And it, it sends a wrong, a wrong message. One of the things you guys got to understand, and, and most of you men here get it, and most of you women probably do too, guys are guys, man. And when guys are together, guys make jokes, and guys do stupid shit. I don't care how old you are. Guys are dumb, and we do dumb stuff. Uh, best example I could ever give you is the Ultimate Fighter. I don't know if you remember, two years ago we got called before the Nevada State Athletic Commission for stuff that went down on the Ultimate Fighter. You know, that stuff, the guys, guys stuff needs to stay in your group of guys. Twitter is the wrong forum to be tweeting things that you saw on TV or that you think are funny that have to do with, you know, touchy subjects. Touchy subjects. Have you tweeted anything that you later regretted? Me? Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the only thing that I've ever regretted was that uh, one word that I said on my video blog. One word. David, can you go back to the, to the day you had to make the decision to cut Miguel? Was there a moment where you said, you know, dang it, kid, if you wouldn't have said this, I wouldn't have to do this? Were you disappointed and conflicted? Obviously, you weren't conflicted. No, you I wasn't at all. It was just, it was unacceptable, and, and I did and I did what I thought was right. You want me to tell you guys what was worse than being fired from the UFC? The worst thing for me than being fired was going to my dad's house on Sunday to eat dinner. Sunday night is huge for my family. We eat dinner, we're all together, we have Mexican food. The kitchen is always packed. I get in, my mom looks at me. She puts her head down and sends me to the kitchen. And my dad's sitting there. No soccer game on TV. TV's off. Food's put away to the side. And I, I knew what it was. I felt like I was 10 years old. I had to face my dad and tell him why I got fired. Everyone knew why I got fired. I had to tell him I got fired for saying some stupid shit. Like everything I've done in my life was to show him how much I appreciate all the sacrifices he made for me. As he, you know, he raised me as a man. He worked every day. We didn't have everything, but I was never without food or clothes. So he raised me to the best that he could. All for me to do better than him. Have a better career, have a better education, all these things. And I had to my death for my, for my, you know, my daughter and, and my family. And me doing this, the biggest hurt out of all of this was me displaying my family like that, my dad. My dad, the look in his face was indescribable how I felt. What did he say to you? What did you guys talk about after you I talked, he didn't have to say anything. My dad doesn't have to speak. He gives me one look. I won't even. I can't even say what he said because I don't want to. I'm not gonna involve him anymore. I'm gonna let you get out of here. Go ahead. I appreciate you it. Get out of here. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, guys. Do you have any idea yet? Who's gonna lead uh, the Montreal card? What's that? Do you have any idea yet? What's gonna be on top of the Montreal card? I have no clue. Okay. I want to ask you about Lesnar. Do you, you know how do you think he's gonna react uh, to the to the loss to Kane? I mean that. Forget about the striking. It was a pretty, you know, he got beat in wrestling. You know, he got beat yeah. in all aspects of MMA. Yeah. And now he's fighting a, a pretty, pretty tough opponent. What, what do you expect from him? I don't know. It's going to be interesting. First of all, he's 100% healthy. Um, he seems in good spirits. He seems like he's in great shape. Um, the thing is, everybody keeps talking about his, you know, his stand up and his chin. Brock Lesnar's got a pretty damn good chin. He's never been knocked out. Um, you know, knocked out. Um, he, he, you know, he got battered by Kane, but, but wasn't knocked out. And as far as his ground game goes, you know, guy today was asking about Alistar's uh, submissions. He fought Frank Mir, you know what I mean? And, right. and Frank Mir caught him once in his first fight. Uh, it'd be hard to say that, that there's too many guys out there in the heavyweight division that are better on the ground than Frank Mir. So uh, this is a very interesting fight. I've said it many times. I've had questions about Alistar. 
you know. Um, all those questions get answered on Friday. I, you know, I, I, we all have our opinions and what we think is going to go down and how it's all going to happen, but we'll find out Friday. He's ornery. He's I'm sorry, he nasty and all that. But do you see now that he's coming off the loss to Kane, lost the title, has some people questioning his ability? Do you sense any uh, extra motivation in him than, than his normal, you know, mean guy attitude? No, he's so hard to read, man. One minute you can be hanging out with him, and he's like, "Well, Brock's in a good mood today," and then you know you meet him the next day, and he's he's back to the old Brock. It's you know he's a very very tough guy to read. So uh, I think he's exactly the same. I think he's just healthier. You know, the surgery was successful. He feels great, and we'll see we'll see what happens. We'll see what all Alistar Overeem really has, and where he really sits in the heavyweight division on Friday night. And the same thing for Brock Lesnar. One last up, uh, question about his uh, his uh, wrestling that or. Brock's wrestling. It seems like Alistair's dealt with some wrestlers before, but nobody that has the athleticism or the quickness of Brock. And do you do you think that that's what sets Brock apart as an MMA fighter? That quick, explosive shot that he has. No doubt about it. I mean, he, he's taken everybody in the heavyweight division down that he's fought, including Kane Velasquez. Right. You know, he took Kane down. He just couldn't keep Kane there. And uh, for Alistair to think that Brock Lesnar can't take it is crazy. Brock Brock Cannon probably will. Uh, the question is, can Brock keep Alistar Overeem down? Does Alistar Overeem have that ability, like the Chuck Liddell ability, like the, uh, you know, like you saw Cain Velasquez pop up from underneath and get up when he gets taken down? If he can do that, it's going to be an interesting night, and it's going to be a long night for Brock. If John Fitch are... wins, uh, what happens to him? We'll see what happens. I don't know. <laughs> He's so, in there. I mean, John Fitch is 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 back up at the at the top of the, uh, you know. The 170 pound division. We got some fights to make for GSP, and, Fitch, and Fitch is in there. So I mean, you at least consider him. A lot of people think that you know your past relations with Fitch. No, no, that's that's such bullshit. Yeah, you know, the, the, you know, people point to the stuff when I when I got into it with him over the video game stuff. I don't even remember that shit till I read it on the fucking internet. You know what I mean? Um, I have no problem with John Fitch. He's a nice guy. He's a good good guy. He's a great fighter. I got no problem with him whatsoever. The ratings came out for the countdown show this week, and it was, it was pretty pretty low. I know you got to start somewhere on Fuel TV, but was that yeah. alarming to you at all, or was that kind of expected? It, no, it wasn't alarming at all. I mean, th those those are the type of ratings that that network pulls, and obviously the uh, when we you gotta understand when we did this deal with Fox, we had to do a deal with one of these major companies that have all these because we have so much content that we have to distribute. We have a ton of content that we want to get out there. And all that content, there's so much crazy content going on fuel, and those numbers will build. We're, we're gonna we're gonna build that network, and we're gonna. I, I can't explain to you guys. There's no bullshit. I'm not trying to hype anything up. I am so pumped for January to come and to dive into this to this deal and, and start working, man. I'm really looking forward to this. And no, the, the numbers weren't alarming. They're exactly what you expect for the for the amount of subs that those guys have. How do you tackle the problem with fuel as an example where they're on premium packages on direct TV and other things and so to get them into a basic package where you have it kind of broad distribution how do you approach that problem? it's gonna happen we're, we're, that's what we're working on right now we're working uh, with Greenberg over at fuel to uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna fix all that fuel TV is going to become a, a a big network. Over well, the do you get? Years. Do you personally, or does Lorenzo? Do, does the UFC get into calling Directv, calling Dish Network, Comcast, and saying, "Hey, move this into a basic"? I mean, do you guys do that? And I don't have know. You done it? No, I have not. We'll see what happens, though. Um, I think that once all this programming goes out on on Fuel, I think the fans are going to end up doing that. You know, more and more people are going to want Fuel. It's it's all about. Listen, I, I mean, you guys could all say this too. I mean, I lay in bed. I have direct TV and I have uh, Cox Cable. You know, what's that, fucking 2,000 channels? And nothing's on. <laughs> I'm laying there, right? I got every single movie channel and everything you can have, and I'm sitting there going, how can I have 2,000 channels and nothing is on TV that I want to watch? And it's true. There's so much bullshit on television, um, and I think that, the, that as far as our fan base goes and as many fans as we have and the amount of content that we're going to have on Fuel TV, People are going to want it, and people are going to be demanding it. If you, you know, when you had your uh, content shows on Spike, and they're close to 100 million, mm -hmm. so that would help you deliver a certain pay-per-view figure. Are you now accept, expecting a little bit less because your, you know, your content shows are going to be on one that has a third of Spike? No, no, I don't, because uh, 
we're gonna uh, the countdown shows are gonna be on FX too. No, on both. Okay. Yeah. So we're uh, and and other things too. We got other things up our sleeve too. <laughs> we're working on some other stuff right now that hopefully will be announced in the next in the next month or so with Fox. Uh, um, UFC is going back to Brazil in January, and there is like a rumor about uh, UFC in a big stadium in June that is going to be like the final of the top of Brazil, and they are saying that Anderson Silva is on fire. Could be true. Yeah, that's probably going to happen. Do you know if it's in the Morubi Stadium or do you decide which stadium are going to be? Still working on it. Dana, when you see fighters like uh, Nate Diaz and Cerrone today slap the hats off and Cerrone is saying that it's likely he's not going to shake his hand after the fight, when you have fights such as that fight, uh, unsportsmanlike content, is that something that concerns you? Like maybe they're versus a tease, for example, something like that. Does it concern you at all? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I'm not overly concerned about it, but yeah, it's, it's something that I think about, no doubt about it. Um, there are definitely two nasty guys. Let me tell you what, you, everybody knows how nasty the Diaz brothers are. Donald Cerrone's not the nicest guy on earth either, you know what I mean? When you, when you Donald, he's a fighter, man. He's got that, you know, they, they both got that you're not going to disrespect me thing. And, yeah, I'm, we're ready for that on, on Saturday night. You can allow Donald to ride in the PBR, by the way. Did what? Allow Donald to ride in the PBR. He said he wants to ride in the PBR. Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Do you actually have a veto over that? Hell yes. <laughs> That's like built into their contract. Well, I, can, I, can, I can tell them, no, you can't go snowboarding. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. Do yes. they have to ask you in order to go snowboarding with a certain amount of time? What's that? For example, if they're going to go snowboarding, do they have to ask you for permission before a certain amount of No, but if I... You know what? What's pretty cool about our guys, most of the guys do call. Say, is it cool if I do this? Is it cool if I do that? Yeah, so it, it, uh, it's, it's actually pretty easy dealing with most of these guys. Dan, I hate to bring up strike force here, but since it has to do with the heavyweights, everybody's trying to understand what's the logic behind the one extra fight. Like, the tournament final makes total sense. Uh, so does that, though. It's, it's not my decision. That's what Showtime wanted. Okay. It does make sense that they invested in this tournament, and then when the tournament ends, the winner fights one more time on Showtime. I mean, th that's what so they want. kind of recouping what they put into it. Yeah, it's, you know, th th they, they invested in this thing long term to have this thing, uh, this tournament done, and they want that one more fight. You know, when, when they when they uh, said that's what we wanted, it wasn't like, that's ridiculous. It makes sense to me, right. you know, that, that they would want that. Would it be against maybe somebody from the UFC, or do you got to find somebody outside? We'll see what happens. We'll see how that whole thing plays out. I was seeing uh, that the date of the Strike Force tournament final might be the same day as the Sydney show. Is that right? Or? I don't know. Okay. I don't know that. Would you do that? I certainly hope not. Okay. Um, and they said March, I think it was 3rd or 4th, which I think yeah. is the same No, day. but it's March 3rd in Sydney. It airs March 2nd like in the United States. Okay. So March, oh, okay, okay, I got it. Yeah, it airs on Friday in the United States and Showtime. Okay. They're both the same day, but oh, okay. international date one. All in the same position. Jones is starting to win all these fights in a row. Uh, beat three former champions in, in the calendar year. Uh, GSP has gone on his unbeaten streak. Um, Anderson, since 2006. Why, why would you... What would be their incentive to move up to 205 pounds and fight a guy that's as huge as John Jones? And what would be uh, George's incentive to, to move up and fight a guy as big as Anderson Silva? You know, Jones going to go to heavyweight. I think Jones will. <laughs> that I think will happen eventually. Just with age, anyway. You know, he's such a young young guy. He's, he's got a long way to go. I mean, if this guy he's 24 years old. I mean, imagine, I just, I, I don't know, the way that he's looked lately, I, I don't know who beats this guy right now. And, and I think that the only one who can beat John Jones is himself over the next few years when you start to get, you know, like Tyson was. Tyson was so destroying everybody. How many more everybody. wins does he need before you'd say he's cleaned out his division? I don't know. We'll see. There's always new guys coming up. There's always new challenges. Um, at what point does he decide to move to heavyweight? You know? Are you sold out on Saturday or Friday? I think so. I, I don't, honestly don't know that question. The last time I knew was a, a couple days ago. We had like 1,400 tickets left. Which so when we get down around 2,000, we consider it a sellout with walk up and all the other stuff. And what's your gate would be if it's a sellout? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that either. You nervous about I'll the, get new, you that the new time and being on Friday? I'm obviously switching back to the old time and yeah, being on Friday. To be honest, we're, we're a little concerned about Friday night. 
everybody's program for Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. Fuck, I was just, I just met with the Metro PCS people. I said, I'll see you Saturday. <laughs> I'm promoting Saturday, this thing. I said, I'll see you Saturday. About 10 minutes ago. Huh? You said Saturday. Did I really? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's... It's got us a little worried. But the problem is, you can't put on fights in, in, in Las Vegas on Saturday nights on... You know, they shut the strip down. You can't even get around here. It would be a nightmare. Any we had to go Friday. Any going somewhere else, or is this the year in Just, tradition? you know, Vegas is the place to go if you're going to go for New Year's. Um, you know, we probably could have gone somewhere else, but... You talked about Abu Dhabi. You said it was a real possibility. What, what ended up happening? Yeah, yeah, we, I don't remember what happened to that. But yeah, it was real close. I was almost 100% confident we were going to go there. Do you have to do a year-end show? Couldn't you do it in, like, first week of January? Or? Um, God, we probably have one next week, don't we? Well, you do, Strike but that's a Strike Force show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm at that one, too, so... <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. I think we got to fight every three days yeah. for the rest of the year. Seems that way. Yeah. yeah. Good? All right. All right, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yep.